So I divided in two parts because uh, um, the first part is about uh, physiology in flies. I don't know, I didn't see anybody really talking about how flies develop in the sense of what are the, um, the things that we have to be careful at when we are doing culture in the lab because it's not trivial, it's nice to show the experiment and so on, but also there are certain things which we know now that are necessary for the flies to develop correctly. And there is no point, for example, to start an experiment if it's, uh, the vial is overcrowded, for example, or if the flies are installation because we are activating pathways and maybe we don't want to have. And so what I thought to do at the beginning is just to give you an overview of the most important signaling that are regulating development and physiology of flies, which we uh, participated a lot in the uh, actually discover some of the signals because it's developing, they are working with Nick and Nick is very important for this kind of process. And then the second part is a very short uh, part where I, um, about the, the project that we developed in my lab uh, since I moved back to Italy three, three years ago. And uh, this is about uh, something which it started already with development and communication between cells like you guys can see from uh, previous talk uh, uh, about the communication between glia and neurons, but I'm taking it from the usual um, physiological point of view. Okay, so I cut a lot of slides and I, well, I was waiting, so I just go fast. I just want to give thanks to this uh, uh, Morgan that actually uh, in the beginning of the century he was studying monsters like Drosophila monster and that he was able to recognize some of these mutants, which uh, now, after many years, we know what they are, but nevertheless, at that time, Drosophila was an animal to study uh, genetics, really like by looking at the mutation, and I just wanted to show you how was the fly room at Columbia at the time. Mm -hmm. So this is it, bananas and a lot of <laughs> motors. Anyway, so what is in our days, what are we doing, and what I'm doing, I'm using Drosophila to study actually human which is a bit of a arrogant to say that, but at least we know now that Drosophila has at least 75% of human uh, of genes which are causing human disease are conserved, and so we can at least apply genetics, and as we already <coughs> talked before, the advantage, the tools, the short uh, generation times, to study mechanisms which are maybe uh, not impossible, not too long to analyze in humans. So, uh, physiology of the flies. The most important tissue that we have to consider are the fat body that we already know is when you open the larva, is this white fat which is filling the, the tube. <laughs> and then we have the imaginal discs which are important for the animal to grow because are the or, uh, tissue or the organs that are going to give rise to the organs in the adult. And the brain, why the brain? Because the brain is regulating the growth through the production of some hormones, and you will see in a moment. We know this, we know that in, at 25 degrees, flies take 10 days to become from egg to adult. Important, growth is happening only in this stage of development. In other words, if you are messing around this part of your uh, growth, then you will end up with an animal which is either too small or too bigger, depending on what you're doing. But nevertheless, growth doesn't happen in the adults. So if you want to start growth, you have to work in this uh, part of the cycle and also analyze that part. So as I said before, ecdyson is very important in the regulation of the growth. As I show you in a moment, ecdyson is produced by the protoracic gland, which is between the two lobes of the brain. And you will see it, probably you have seen it already, when you dissect the brain and you have this huge uh, and the replicative tissue on between the two lobes is the prothoracic gland, or collapsorid gland, which is producing all these hormones. And ecdyson is important because it is produced in pigs before molting, you know, um, Drosophila divided in three stage, larva one, two, three, every more or less 24 hours. But the metamorphosis, it, it happens when the, there is a huge peak of ecdyson and then the animal feels like it has to change and undergo to metamorphosis. It's not so simple because also the metamorphosis is regulated by the fat body, and I will tell you in a moment why. And also by a very nice mechanism which was discovered uh, recently about bilpate, which is a molecule which is produced by a linger tissue, 
which is capable of regulating the length of development because, uh, and that I found fascinating, flies, knows, and <coughs> maybe uh, you can tell me if it's wrong, no, they know when they can become an adult or not, in the sense, if a fly has an injured disc, imagine a disc that they cannot fly because they cannot make a full uh, wing, so they stop developing this, slow down, until they can regenerate the tissue so they can become a real healthy fly and survive. So I think this is very fascinating and me. So, ecdyson, briefly, I told you, the ring gland is between the two lobes and the larva is also present in the adult. The function of the ecdyson in the adult is less, I wouldn't say important, but maybe less uh, uh, known. And uh, during development, as I told you, we have this molt, and then uh, uh, and then ecdyson, which is released from the prothoracic glands, goes into the uh, hemolymph and controls the peak of the uh, development. If we block and uh, the, this uh, production of ecdyson, maybe genetically, uh, with uh, reducing the size, for example, of this gland then development is also blocked and the animal does undergo pupariation and keeps growing and becomes a huge larva until they die uh, even after three, three weeks. Important is, uh, um, is this, we have used this to study actually a model for the um, uh, obesity and the fat uh, communication using this type of model. Anyway, another important uh, signal for the growth and for uh, the development are insulin and tor signaling, which are the nutrients. So when we prepare food, basically what we give to the animal with yeast, we give amino acid, meaning tor signaling. You've already seen tor signaling already before when uh, Thomas was talking about autophagy. And nevertheless, there is part of autophagy which we might talk later on. But what is important here is to know that if you start the animal, so maybe the tube is old, it is dry, they cannot eat, you will end up with animals which are so small because there is no insulin signaling and TOR signaling available for the animal, so the animal reduces the size because, and this was also a nice work, was linked to the release of a peak of endizo, which is earlier than the normal at 25, and so the animal is becoming a pupa and metamorphosis when it's smaller. And nevertheless, on the contrary, if you overexpress in the whole animal, like DILPs, which are the insulin-like peptide, the animal is bigger compared to control. Every mutant of these pathways, which are loss of function of insulin signaling or TOR uh, pathway, or gain of function of uh, this pathway, are end up with either loss of function small flies or gain of function big flies. And we, I don't want to talk about this because it's just a lot of uh, data, but this is uh, actually the protein synthesis and growth and size and it is involved and so on. But I don't want to talk about this now, I just want to talk about the physiology of the organs. Another important organ is the fat body. As I told you, the white part of the larva, filling up the larva. And why is it important? It's important because the fat body in the animal is actually what is sensing the amino acid concentration. So if you prepare a food which is really rich of amino acid, okay, I think there is, uh, um, there is not too much yeast that you can add, but there is a problem if you add too much yeast because, yeast because then the animal feels that it is starvation. So what happens when the animal is well fed and the, the amount of yeast is okay, then you, the fat body is sensing the concentration of amino acid, is activating TOR signaling in the fat body. TOR signaling is then, oh sorry, this mic was not supposed to be there, that was um, something we found, but forget. Anyway, the fat body is producing some factors which are released in the emolyl of the animal, there are a couple of them which have recently been identified, and then the, the secreted factors are acting on the insulin-producing cells which are in the brain, and the insulin-producing cells, when food is around, are releasing DILPs, 2, 3, and 5, which are controlling growth. Everything is fine. When the animal is in starvation instead, this is an example, start food, DILPs are the signal, secreted signal from the fat body is not released, and so DILPs are retained in the, in, the, in the cells here. So if this signal is off, then DILP is not produced, then the animal does not grow. So this is very important, again, for when you are considering your 
culture, your results even sometimes, because uh, I think we had some data on the regeneration, but not in the brain, but in the wing. And then, for example, installation, regeneration doesn't happen. So maybe there is something also important for the animal to be well fed. Okay, maybe mm, um, the fat body is secreting something, you know. But that's an old experiment that I did with the Torrensi Serras uh, many years ago, and so. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of <laughs> yeah, sure. I know. So, okay. Again, the fat body. Why are we talking about the fat body? Because uh, um, in my data, I'm going to show you that autophagy, and you probably already know, is uh, uh, mm, a mechanism that is uh, um, rescuing neurodegenerative diseases, for example, because it's killing the neurons, because it's keeping the neuron healthy, because it's is chewing these aggregates of uh, mm, that many neurodegenerative diseases are producing in neurons. However, autophagy is fundamental for the animals to survive because during metamorphosis, again, uh, the fat body is releasing through autophagy all the nutrients which are necessary for the animal to survive metamorphosis because they have to stay for three days without eating. And so what happens is that the nutrients are coming from the fat body which is undergoes to what is called developmental autophagy, which, guess what, is induced by reducing insulin toxinary, but is automatically in the animal. And this it depends on this picovec diesel that I showed you before. I don't want to confuse this, because it's uh, not complicated for me, because I, I've seen it many times, but in any case, in starvation, we are inducing autophagy because we are reducing insulin signaling the animals. Does, feels that there are no nutrients around, so needs to produce food for some, somewhere else, and it uses autophagy through the fat body. Because the fat body is the storage of all the nutrients. It happens also to us when we are in a diet, and then we want to lose weight, and then we take, uh, we induce autophagy in our body when we're not eating by taking out the nutrients, from, especially at the beginning, from the fat. Same things happen in development. In developmental autophagy, the animals needs to find the nutrients for this passage, and this uh, autophagy is regulated <coughs> through ectizone. The peak of ectizone, I showed you before, is reducing insulin signaling, and insulin signaling, we know, is uh, in vitro autophagy, because it looks like there are nutrients, so ectizone through insulin signaling is then allowing autophagy in the metamorphosis. Okay. And I, I'm saying that because later on, it's important to distinguish the autophagy that is happening in the fat body and in the other part of the animal. Okay, this is autophagy, and I think we already seen that before, right? I don't go through this. What is important, what I want you to remember, that autophagy is always uh, active when uh, uh, nutrients are low. So, and because TOR signaling can inhibit autophagy by phosphorylation, by other means. Last signal which I was told is important is dilpate. Dilpate is produced when an animal or a tissue is, and is uh, injured, like by what, for example, you, you are doing, you are probably that you are inducing deal plate in this I system. Look, yeah. <laughs> and then, deal plate uh, is then released in, uh, in the hemolymph, and then is binding the receptor on the neurons, and then is binding a type of receptor which then produces an inhibitor of ectizone, and then the results of this is that the animal slow down development, because, uh, and because they have to rescue these status where they are not, for example, forming or the disc is injured or the disc has to be able to regenerate and then, then the animal can develop them constantly. If, for example, in this animal I showed you before, um, where the ectizone is totally reduced, deal fate is very high and this and deal fate will never go down because this animal cannot actually never recover from that status. So deal fate is another important um, mechanism for the regulation of the physiology and the growth of the animal. Okay, this is just to summarize all these uh, factors to keep in mind from the fat body. There are factors which are, fat body is important, it's important because it senses the amino acid. The amino acid are in the food, amino acid in the fat body are releasing factors that can reduce or induce the production of bilbs and then the animal can and if the disc is damaged, that dilpate is actually produced, and then dilpate can, in the brain, 
reduce egg dyson and allowing development to be longer so that the animal can recover and maybe develop normally. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention briefly, and I can give you the slides anyway because uh, maybe a, a really a summary of all, are the techniques because we talked a lot about ERS before, in, oh, we used a lot of ERS before in our talk, but I guess I bet you know this system, right? You have seen it already. So this is important, all normal so the experiments are done in this way, but what is important to consider is that sometimes we don't want to have something expressed in the development because we have seen now that development has to go through its own way, especially if you're studying maybe something nervous in the adults, you don't want to have it expressed through, through development. And so you can use the Galati, temperature sensitive, which maybe you've seen it already. It's, uh, Galati is a protein that binds GAL4 and inhibits GAL4. So you can have Galati active if you grow your flies at certain temperature, which is 18 degrees. And so the GAL4 is not expressed. And then when the animal is born or whenever you want to induce expression of your gene, you just release the temperature to 29 degrees. Galati is degraded, GAL4 is expressed, and now you have your gene. It's important when something is lethal or sometimes when you do your fat survival assay and you see that your gene is lethal to development, so then you switch to this system and then you analyze when you want. Day one, when they are born, etc. But this is a very handy system to, to study something which is lethal or you don't want to have it expressed through development. Another system which is uh, uh, now is very, this is kind of old, even is very well used, are combination of binary systems. So we use US control because they are the most common, they are many flies, etc. But we can also use other systems. For example, I'm using Lexo Lexa. And I don't think I have time today to show you, but Alexa, Alexa, to express um, genes which are toxic in the glia or neurons, and then change the genetic background of the other component glia or neurons. So to see how, for example, killing the neurons with antitin would affect the glia, which is now can be manipulated with US drug four. So you can use this, for example, in neurons and kill the neurons, and then manipulate the genetic background of glia using the US GAL4, and these two can be combined together. And it's very simple. Now you can even do look at Bloomington um, region, and then look under Lexo Alexa, and you may be confined with your promoter, and vice versa. I mean, remember, Drosophilus uh, likes to play a lot, so you have lots of things that you can do in a short time. So you just look at the website, you can always publish something, ask for the reagents, and there are lots of things that you can do. And, and very nice. Okay. I think I already said that. Why we need to know all this? We need to know all this because when you are set up, we are setting up a cross, you have to keep in mind all this information, which maybe I didn't know when I started. And then uh, if your uh, um, culture is not well, if you are overcrowded bile, for example, insulin signaling is definitely low in these tubes. And so if insulin signaling is low, I already show you what happened. Pfizer really is more you have to dissect the brain, mm. I don't know. So be careful to leave your culture very uh, changing so often, also because animals should be developmental stage to analyze a phenotype. That what does it mean? mean that you have to lay your eggs in your tubes for maximum like six hours, because six hours in development is really a lot, as you probably know, you should before. And so doing short deposition and then analyze the phenotype is the best way to make sure that you have also less statistic variation. Okay, after saying that, I start with the project. So as I said, I start with Nick and Nick and Groth, that was my, still my primary project. However, we developed over the time also another project which was to understand how Nick can regulate growth non-autonomously and um, another project through the obesity and immune cells uh, with the system I showed you before, but today, what I want to concentrate is to talk about this little project about polygonal regeneration, maybe it's not the right things, but it's mainly about the function of GS1 of glutamate, glutamine metabolism in Huntington disease. Why is that? Because always working with the growth and the communication between cells and meat, I always was interested in the communication between cells. So like uh, cell competition for me, are two population cells growing next to each other with different metabolic pathway. 
obesity and the immune system, and now glia and the neurons. So this is a very uh, schematic cartoons um, who works really in uh, maybe neuro. It will tell me that is missing something here, but that's okay. And then we decided to start this by analyzing um, the function of Huntington or Huntington disease using the Huntington uh, model in twice. Uh, we started like this because in Milan there we have some collaboration with the Neurological Institute, so we can also have the human and the mind counterpart if we are interested. And actually, it was a very nice collaboration. So, a few words about Huntington. Huntington disease is a, is a dominant uh, uh, genetic disease, which is, uh, uh, was actually found, already known, more than found, in, at the end of uh, uh, in, in 1872 by Dr. Huntington, that's why the name, where he noticed that some patients were like having this strange movement, chorea, which is like a dance, and then it's only more than 100 years later that the gene was identified. And in fact, when they identified the gene and they found that specifically in Venezuela there were some families which were really, uh, had really high incidence of this disease, they understood that the gene and then the protein from this patient contained a polycule which was very long compared to what we normally have. Like in our case, we have more or less in, our, in the end terminus of the gene, then the protein, a repeated of 35 CAG. Um, instead, in the mutant protein, the repeats are much longer, let's say 36 alpha. And uh, why and what and how this has happened, still don't know. And uh, there are many um, pathological conditions for Huntington, but the main uh, the main, I must say, uh, phenotype is that the um, mutant protein is causing aggregates or is producing aggregates inside the cells, the whole body, not just the neurons, which are then causing the cells to die. Obviously, the neurons is the first to suffer because you will see first the problem with the movement, but these patients are also diabetic and uh, there are other problems in, uh, in not only neurological problems. Other um, feature of Huntington is that a disease that is also coming out late during uh, age, and uh, uh, some people do not have the disease until 40, late 40s. And so, if I mean, it can be um, a problem. Mm, no, but if, for example, because I'm part of this association, which is called Huntington uh, European Huntington Network Disease, where we meet every year. Uh, with the family patient and so on. And some of these patients, they just saw something obviously strange in their fathers, for example, but they didn't know they had a disease. And then they, they are not sick. Obviously, the first thing to do is go and check if you are also carrying the gene. And, uh, and sometimes you don't have the phenotype until 40 years old, but you are carrying the gene which has the extra uh, repeats. So that's a situation that is really uh, difficult. But I'm very happy to be part of this session because you really have to talk with the patient, with the family, and with people that are doing something for them, which is really nice. Anyway, parenthesis. Other uh, feature of this disease is that the, CG, the longest is the CAG, and the, uh, the early onset is the, of the disease. For example, if you have a sample to analyze which has 90 CAG, you already know that it's like children because the more longer is the CAG, the more early is the disease. So probably for um, formation of aggregates or something like that. Anyway, how to study this in trials? So as I told you before, we have the US welfare system. We can use promoter that we like the best. We start with the retina, and then we express the, a gene that is a human gene that contains 93 polycule repeated, and we observed Okay, the rationale to do that first, and also this is important for whenever you start to do something, when you have a project, the rationale to do something. The rationale for me to do this was, first of all, I was reading about this, and I saw that patients 
with the Huntington disease uh, had a reduced level of this enzyme, which is called glutamine synthetase. And uh, um, the other things which we found that by taking fibroblasts from patients, not neurons because we could not how to, to uh, produce neurons from fibroblasts, it's possible, but the amount that you get at the end is not enough, especially because we had fibroblasts from patients with different length of CAG. Nevertheless, in collaboration with BESTA, we found that the, the fibroblasts from patients with the longest CAG had the high concentration of glutamine in the cell. So with the two, um, two, with the two rational uh, observations, we decided to use drosophila and manipulate the expression of the enzymes which are controlling glutamine in the cells. The two enzymes are GDH and GS1. So we have data for both, but today we are only I'm going to talk about GS1 only. So we did this uh, for, uh, from the beginning. So we expressed antintin, mutated antintin in the retina. And the retina looks like this. So it's whitish because underneath is degenerating. We have also sections to show you that the retina is actually um, full of holes. And then we took a, what is called a screen or whatever, genetic interaction analysis and taking animals with different expression level of these enzymes, which are part of the pathway of glutamine glutamate, and see if by any chance some of them was rescuing the phenotype. And lucky enough, we saw that overexpression of GS1 actually rescued the phenotype. Well, it was not something unexpected, because if you think that the function of GS1 <coughs> is to uh, transport glutamate into glutamine, and glutamate is what causing the the toxicity, so obviously we now have more glutamine, and then we have less glutamate, and the flies are fine. Not so simple. In any case, we measured glutamate and glutamine in the heads of the animals which were expressing this enzyme, and we also found that uh, glutamate was higher in Q93 uh, uh, flies, and then we, when we were expressing GS1, it was reduced, and glutamine was increased. So everything is okay. So then we decided to use another promoter, which is LRV, that we already heard before, is uh, expressing all the neurons, and see what happened to the animal to have a, also a possibility to do more than just analyzing the eye. And here is basically what I was really surprised that after 24, 48 hours of expression, you can see already all the aggregate, aggregates of antintin in the animals. And in fact, that's what we are going to do today. So you're having larvae, this type of genotype, and you are going to dissect the brain and observe how neurons are already uh, expressing this, this protein, meaning it's very fast to study the, the effect of this, or how to reduce this gene in, in neurons. And these are actually two movies which uh, are showing how it's possible also to work already in, in larvae. So if some of you wants to go and work on neurodegeneration, and you don't have to wait until the, you have an adult if you want to analyze something. For example, you can work with larvae and analyze the motility of this, and we did that, in fact. We have our arena, which is just a, a petri dish with some little squares. We put the larva in the middle, and we count how many times, in three minutes, how many squares the larva can fall, and then we make this in a graph. And then, of course, larvae, which were expressing the mutant protein, were, were walking much slower, and then uh, we could rescue this by expressing GS1. Same things we did it in adults, and this is a climbing acid which I also brought today to do so, but it depends if we have time we can do it. I basically, that's why how we generated this uh, data, and that's why I was saying before we need to do this, especially I have my first students doing this at 6 o'clock every day, especially in a little corner of the lab because he said only there it works. So, <coughs> but now, by knowing that how circadian clock, temperature, who knows what, light especially can influence it, so I believe it. Anyway, so by doing this assay, uh, we, we can see that with 293, 50% of the flies do not climb after eight, nine days. With GS1, they could actually be rescued to 12, 13 days, which is a lot for a life of a fly. And these are some pictures of the brain of these other flies. This is the wild type fly. This is a drosophila with the antintin. Lots of parts of the brain which are missing. And this is uh, actually the rescue. Same flies with antintin and flying and uh, expressing GS1. So definitely we can also rescue the, the neuronal degeneration. 
But again, what are the, why Huntington or why we have this uh, loss of, of neurons in our flies? One of, thought that we, one of the things we thought was because uh, of these aggregates we mentioned, and then maybe GS1 was capable of reducing the number of aggregates in these cells. So we went to see, and in fact, this is something that also we will see today. You will dissect brains from Huntington with the autophagy at the same time. So because we have a TGF cherry, which is uh, marking autophagy, and the GFP Huntington, which is uh, marking the aggregates. And sometimes, uh, we did that before, you can really see how autophagy is embracing these aggregates and then showing them. I mean, it's a very beautiful uh, image. If we can make some pictures, that would be nice. Nevertheless, GS1 was reducing the size of the antintin aggregates in the brains, and one of the mechanisms which we already know is autophagy. So, and here I bring back what I said before about autophagy development. Autophagy in the neurons is a, a, has another function which is more important than survival, but is the eliminates all these debris and toxic aggregates, mitochondria, mitophagy, you know that already, which are causing the cells to die. And in fact, luckily enough, we went to see our flies and we went to see what happened to ATGA cherry vesicles, which has an indication of formation of autophagy. And we saw that overexpression of GS1, together with the mutant antintin, was increasing autophagy, suggesting that this animal has a higher level of autophagy and probably is autophagy that is reducing the size of the aggregate. Okay, until now, everything makes sense, but here is the... But, so I said that um, GS1 is producing glutamine, right? I said that glutamine is an amino acid. I said that terse signaling is stimulated by amino acid, but terse signaling should be reduced in order to have autophagy. There's something wrong, something doesn't really fit the picture. However, there was this paper uh, published in 2012, uh, made uh, from Paul Popper, so uh, it made in experiment made in uh, tumor cells and uh, um, primary cells that shows that there is starvation. FOXO, which is a target of insulin signaling, when insulin signal is gone, starvation. FOXO activates GS1 transcriptionally. GS1 can, of course, uh, produce more glutamine, and now the glutamine which is produced somehow, and they don't know how, block TOR signaling and allowing autophagy to start and then allowing tumor cells to grow. We tried and we looked at our data and then we of course found that over, mm, while in co 93 a 6 can which is a target of TOR activation was increased, in the presence of GS1 or GS1 alone, a 6 can is totally inhibited, suggested that TOR signaling is off. However, we have more... Just one Overexpression. Okay. However, we, I showed you before, we have more glutamine and I have more data showing that GS1 is actually inducing, uh, increasing the concentration of glutamine. So, second thing that we try to, to find out is that we know that when TOR is active, it has to be sitting on the lysosome in order to be able to function with all the other complex and uh, to phosphorylate in six times and so on. So another way to see if TOR is active or if there is activation of TOR is see if it's localizing to the, with the lysosome. And we analyze on neurons by using LAV lamp GFP, which is a um, marker for lysosomes, and anti-TOR antibody. And of course, we found that TOR is not active because it's not sitting on the lysosome. So this data is true. So S6 can is reduced, TOR is inhibited. However, we have more glutamine. And end of the story. <laughs> and then we are here, so I don't know. <laughs> well, we have uh, some ideas, so maybe more and more data every day are coming out of TOR activation by different amino acids. Uh, didn't, I didn't mention about the glutamine receptors, which are uh, on the cells in glia, probably also in neurons, which can be activated or activating some kind of loop, which mm, I mean, not, nothing is really, really known. And even the other group which published the data on cancer cells didn't have any explanation about this. So I don't know. We'll see what the reviewer will tell me. 
but I don't have it, the explanation, I don't know. Um, so that's it. That's the picture of the lab actually in Milan. In Trent, we are only in two now. The sponsor, actually the European Huntington disease, which was really, really helpful for uh, main point of view, and uh, Tariplo, which is in uh, Milan. Thank, Thank you, you for your <laughs>